Welcome to Landlord Diaries, where we talk about midterm rentals and the opportunities behind them. We'll share landlord stories, talk about maximizing investment potential, and discuss how to live the very best landlord life. This podcast is proudly brought to you by Furnished Finder, the place for everything midterm rentals. Remember to like and subscribe if you enjoy our content. It's your host of the Landlord Diaries, Kelly Bailey, coming to you with five or so midterm rentals in the Austin, (laughs) Texas area. I can't keep counting more, Katie, because uh, of adding the room rentals. Now I just, it Mm. just looks like a lot of listings on my profile page. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, because you're making moves, girl. I like it. You're trying new things. Trying. Well, everyone, I'm Katie Lyon. I'm the marketing director for Furnished Finder, and I also have some midterm rentals of my my own. I was going to say of myself, but of my (laughs) own. Um, We get to talk today with Christian and Christian is in Buffalo, New York, and he is one of the arbitrage kings. So all of his midterm, midterm rentals are arbitrage. So we get to talk a lot of logistics, like how do you furnish 30 units? How do you get um, all these landlords to agree to your setup. How do you get some free months of rent? Um, how do you establish yourself with recruiters? And we also talk about goat yoga. So <laughs> it's, it's a good episode. I hope you all enjoy it. And please don't forget that this episode and every episode is brought to you by Furnished Finder, where you can list your midterm rental for $99 a year and absolutely no booking fees. So let's go. Today we talk with Christian Bauman in Buffalo, New York. Christian has chosen to keep his monthly furnished rental investment strategy close to home with an arbitrage portfolio of 30 plus units in Buffalo, New York that is generating 50K per month. Christian, we really appreciate you being here today. We look forward to telling your story. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited to be here and to be talking with you guys. Yes, sir. Well, you know, I think with this episode, we really need to start off with why arbitrage? Like you jumped into arbitrage at 21 years old. What led you to that path when a lot of college kids or fresh out of college aren't even thinking that clearly yet? <laughs> yeah, that that's right. Um, yeah, so I got started at 21 with rental arbitrage, mostly because um, I got really into the idea of real estate investing. And at the time, I was really into this idea of like passive income um, at around like 20 years old. Um, <clears throat> and basically, eventually, I, I got sick of college. I dropped out. Um, I looked at my bill at the end of the semester. Like I was, I went to the university of Buffalo for one semester. Um, I looked at the bill it was like $10,000 for one semester. And I looked back at my experience. And I was like, man, for $10,000, like I could have done so much cooler stuff. Like this, this sucked for $10,000. <laughs> Are you kidding me? This sucks. Um, and so I was just, I, I dropped out I, after that. I, I, I didn't want to go back to school. And um, so I just wanted to figure out, like, I knew I wanted to start my own business. I knew it was probably going to be somewhere, something to do with real estate. I didn't know exactly what it was going to be. But then I came across the arbitrage model. And um, again, I was 21 years old. I had no money. I had no experience. I had no connections. I don't have family that's from real estate. I was like serving at a restaurant. And uh, I came across this arbitrage model. I was like, hmm, like, I think I could do that. And uh, so I did. I started with one unit in back in, in 2018. That is a powerful story that probably a lot of people need to hear because, you know, some some get in the mindset of what you know, they just get stuck. People get stuck in, in not knowing where to go next. And I love that you just you know what? This is doable. I'm going to give it a shot and I'm going to go for it. And. I think that's a refreshing outlook on college, on life, on business. So thanks for sharing that. Katie, anything to add? I think that's, that's really cool that you're a real life example of that per se, right? Because so, so much in our culture, we're said like, you know, go to college, get your degree, follow the chain of natural events, if you will. But so often that's not the right path for people, I think, especially more and more. And for things like real estate investing, you don't necessarily need a degree, right? Everything I've I've learned 
from real estate has come from outside of my college years. Even, I mean, I have a, a degree in marketing, but it's 15 years old. So how much of what I learned is still relevant? It's, it's just, it's not always the cut and dry path anymore. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I'd, I'd assert like in this day and age, um, most even if you are looking to get like a, a typical job, most employers are uh, much more looking for skills and experience. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people, dude, just keep learning, keep investing into yourself. I mean, for some people, maybe that is college. But for a lot of us, um, if you're not in, if, like, especially if you're not enjoying it, like it's an expensive education. I mean, really for $10,000, I could pay there's a lot of people that would be willing like if you hey listen anyone listening to this if you want to pay me ten thousand dollars i'll teach you everything you need to know about the midterm rental business right and you'll learn from someone who's actually doing in the business right so that's and that's what i do it's like i pay coaches and mentors um as opposed to the the traditional pathway to learn you know and that's kind of what's worked for me i also think just like going and getting to explore right like there's always some stuff you're gonna, you're, if you wanna be a doctor or you wanna be an engineer, you gotta go to school, right? But if you don't necessarily wanna follow kind of the, the regular path like that, like go explore. I wish I would've had the time and opportunity to do that after high school, right? It's just to go, just to go explore and see what sticks. There's a lot to be said about the entrepreneurial spirit, right? It's like a lot of people probably need college because they need that that structure and that system but entrepreneurs a lot of times my dad was similar he he did not finish college either and he has owned his own business for i think almost 40 years now uh, somewhere between 30 and 40 years and he's provided very well for our family so yeah i think i think this is a great kick off to the conversation to talk about your portfolio and now what you've grown it uh, to through the arbitrage mo model and really embracing that opportunity to scale quickly through that. So tell us about your port, your current portfolio and how long it took you to, to get there. Sure. Yeah. Um, currently we have 30 units, um, <clears throat> all through rental arbitrage, all located in Buffalo, New York. Um, I've, been in the business now uh, just under five years. Um, however, it actually took me, so to get from my first listing to seven listings took me three years. It took me three years to get from one to seven listings. And there's then, a lot of systems to figure out in that I, time. Yeah, there's a lot to learn. There's a huge learning curve. I mean, I pivoted in the beginning when I started arbitrage, I was starting, I started with just doing short-term rentals. I was just doing like basically Airbnb short-term rentals. When COVID hit, that's when I stumbled upon the midterm rental market and uh, it fell in love with it and then just switched everything over to midterm because I was like, this is awesome. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it took me three years to get to seven listings. And then uh, in the beginning of 2022, I, uh, met like the right landlords. I met a couple of the right people and, um, and I had kind of the processes and systems in place to be able to take, take off. And now in the past 18 months, we've grown from seven listings to 30. Now you keep saying we, who's we, so we oh, know who's <laughs> No, we is actually just me. <laughs> we, <laughs> you no, would not be no, the first to do that. <laughs> no, yeah, I always say we because it, it sounds more professional or when I'm talking oh, about Oh, 100%. I'm always, yeah, I, I'm always used it's to It's like just, rule number one of business, like, like make yourself sound bigger than you are. Yeah, yeah, like <laughs> people, like we, it's it's just me. I, you know, I try to make it sound like a professional, whatever, but it's just me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Well, that's great. That's even more impressive, right? So it, are there any set, like, let's break those two uh, positions down. What, when you look back to that, it took three years to get to one to seven listings. What would you tell yourself you know, back in those days? And then how did you scale so quickly to get to the 30 now uh, in a much quicker time frame? Like, what's the mindset behind it for you? Um, one, like I mentioned, like I... Basically, I met the right people, so I would have, mm -hmm. I would tell myself just like keep networking, keep um, it, building relationships. Um, and the thing about relationships is they do take time to build. Um, you you know, so like that was something like over those three years, like I was kind of also just establishing a name for myself, um, showing people that like, hey, like I'm not just a 22 year old kid, like I'm actually, you know, a serious. Uh, 
person entrepreneur that's actually like I'm in the business and this is what I'm doing and I'm committed and honestly I wouldn't take any of that back like I think you need those first couple of years to get beat up a little bit and to learn um and just like you you got to go through those first couple of years so that you can be ready when the right opportunity comes to like actually take your business to the next level like i i honestly i i wouldn't i don't regret it like taking that long to get to seven listings like Good. you have to go through it um just a quick antidote like i i practice brazilian jiu-jitsu like a martial art right the only way to learn brazilian jiu-jitsu is literally to get beat up every single day <laughs> like okay and it's the same you in business you have to go through the suck yeah this, like the only way is like to go to class and learn from people who are way better than you and you're going to slowly day after day get better and it's the same in business yeah that's that's really interesting you say that i think it's also you have to have that trial and error time because real estate investing is an art right it's not always a science it's like a scientific art but you have to see what you like and what works for you and what doesn't um i mean we have a property that right now we're kind of tinkering with like do we sell do we not and on paper it's like no just hold on to it and it'll be profitable in the long term but we're like mm, but it's not what we want to do right so there's a lot of like it's not all black and white um 100 yeah the other thing that you said is is about networking and i know i'm a surprisingly probably a textbook introvert and networking to me has always felt like a slow death and a certain type of poison and I <laughs> hate it. But when you're in the right space talking about the right thing, networking is not painful. Christian, you and I met at the midterm rental summit and we had a great conversation and I did not hate any of it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's like a key to know that you're like, you're doing the right thing, right? Is like when you're like, okay, networking, like it's a necessary evil, but it doesn't feel so evil when you're doing what you should be doing yeah. right no when you're when you're in the right room you, you'll feel like you're right at home like M the mtr summit man, i felt like i was with my people and i right? just like like i oh real yeah seriously so uh when you're in the right rooms you'll 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 probably know it you'll feel it absolutely all right so talk to us about your monthly cash flow you've got fifty thousand dollars you bring in every month in tenant paid rents yeah yeah that's correct tell us Tell us how that breaks down as far as then what, you know, what your profit looks like, what your cash flow looks like and, and how you kind of manage all of that. Yeah. And it's a little, it's more than, than 50 K now. Cause that was 50 K was when I was at 26 units. So now we're at 30. So it's a little, probably closer to 60 now. Um, but my goal is always to basically, um, 1.8 to two X my base rent. So my main business model has basically Buffalo is a cheaper market. Um, I'm basically taking thousand dollar apartments and turning them into two thousand dollar apartments by furnishing them and then offering, you know, taking professional photos, professionalizing it, and then um, offering like short term flexible lease agreements uh, or not, you know, mid term flexible lease agreements. Um, so basically, my goal is to to at least double my uh, base rents, and we're operating pretty much like 20, 25 percent net profit margins right now um and it's it's uh it's good it you know i'm reinvesting for the past again 18 months we've gone really fast so every all the money i make i'm reinvesting into the next deal and into the next deal so i pay myself very like i'm dude i live on three thousand dollars a month and mm -hmm. i i'm 26 i can i don't need to impress anybody i like i drive a 2016 honda santa fe i have a basic apartment um, if I wanted to splurge more, I probably could, but like for right now, like I have no one to impress. Um, I'm living on just like a, a small income and just reinvesting everything, you know, into the next deal, into the next deal. And, um, just to, I want to just, you know, like this for me, the business is like, it's the golden goose, man. That's what brings all the, all the eggs. So that's for me, that's what's important. Sounds like you're making a lot of good choices for sure. So let's get into, we know you have. 30 right now, but let's break those down a bit. Sure. Like, is, uh, are you offering studios? Are you offering two mm, bedrooms, mm. three bedrooms? Like what's your mix of properties? Yeah, I've got a good, um, a solid mix. I have a lot of studio apartments. 
um, mm -hmm. a lot of studios, and there seems to be a lot of demand for, especially the travel a lot nurses. Of studio apartments. A lot of studios because they are, um, I mean, they're nice, they're clean, they're comfortable, and they're affordable. Um, mm -hmm. And so a lot of the travel nurses that I, I work with, like, they just need something again clean comfortable and affordable and they just want to be close to the hospital they don't need um like anything luxurious or you know any of these like crazy th thrills like they just need a nice clean quiet spot that they can um stay in and feel safe um and be close to the work so um i think yeah most of my portfolio is, is studios with a couple one bedrooms i've got maybe four or five two bedrooms and i think i have three uh, units that are three bedrooms, uh, but mo it's mostly studios and uh, and uh, and one bedrooms. But the the studios kill. The studios do really well. They're booked for sure back to back. So what do you do with your two bedrooms and three bedrooms? Uh, I mean same thing. A lot of times. So with those, I do get a lot of bookings uh, from it's still like about sixty percent of my total bookings are from travel nurses across my entire portfolio, and a lot of the two bedrooms. Uh, and three bedrooms do get booked by travel nurses and it's usually just travel nurses that are like kind of teaming up and um, like booking the place together. And are they reaching out to you directly like that? Hey, we want, you know, this three bedroom mm -hmm. and are they paying individually? Do they just all put their money together and pay together? How does the payment side work? Yeah, they book it all together. Like I'm not renting it out by the room and then it, it's up to that. And like if they want to pay me and like half and half or if they like, you know, sort it out amongst themselves and pay me direct. As long as I get the full rent amount, it doesn't really matter to me. Okay, nice. All right, so one thing that Kelly has noted is that you've said that it's easier to keep 26, 30, however that, you know, the higher number booked than it is when you had seven listings. Tell us a little bit more about that because that feels very counterintuitive. Yes, that is counterintuitive, yes. Yeah. So it is easier now for me to keep my 30 units booked than it was back a couple of years ago when I only had four units or five units. The reason for that is because now that I have scale, um, people are much more open and willing to talk to me. So what a lot of, like I talk to a lot of landlords and a lot of them will say like, oh, like I called some like uh, travel nurse, like recruiters. And I told them about like, I have two properties and they didn't really seem too interested or they never like, you know, whatever. I call, when I call a, a, a recruiter, and I tell them, hey, I have 30 units across the city of Buffalo. Um, and so, like, if you send a nurse my way, I will find housing for them. And even if I'm fully booked, if I don't have housing, I have a network of other hosts in the area. I know all the major hosts in the area. Send me any travel nurses that are coming to the city, and I will help them find housing. So help me God. Whether it's with me across my portfolio or across um, the, my, you know, anyone else that's in my network, like, I'll help them find housing. So with that like scale and with, I mean, that pitch, why would a recruiter not send their travel nurses mm -hmm. to me as opposed to the traditional, like people who are doing things the traditional way and they're owning properties and, you know, they're doing growing slowly, which is fine. But if you have two, two, uh, two units in some city and you're calling a recruiter who's probably on the other side of the country, by the way, and you call them and say, Hey, I have two units in Buffalo, New York. They're like, great, great for you. Like, okay. Like, it, you're not a resource to them. Exactly. And if anything, you're creating more work for them. Cause it's like, what are they, what are they going to do? They're going to like write, they're, they're not compiling a list of every landlord that's in every city. Mm -hmm. They just would like, you got to make their life easy and exactly be a resource for them. So I'm calling them and I'm saying, Hey, I've got a bunch of units. I know everybody who has a, a lot of furnished units, send them my way and I'll help them out. I think that I think you make a good point because there's there's two ways that you hear about people kind of formatting their their portfolios, right? One is to diversify and get a few properties in this city, a few properties in that city, and that does shield you from you know some local market risk or anything like that, right? Like if there's a big storm or a natural disaster, only a few of your properties will get hit, something like that. Like it does it does shield you from stuff. But when you go deep in one market, you become a bigger player and you become much more of a resource to travel nurse agencies and recruiters and insurance um, housing providers and all of those places you really can make their lives easier versus just kind of being a bug in their side if you will exactly I always like how Jesse Vasquez puts it he says you know see a need 
solve a, solve a need. There's so many problems out there that if you can be the solution to that problem, it is making their life easier. And that's what we all, we want that ease, right? So that's a, uh, that's a really good perspective. Um, and then one other thing that you do different than a lot of people is you prefer the small to mid-sized cities um, and typically close to hospitals. So tell us about your choices there. Yeah, 100%. I, I like I talk to a lot of people who think that especially like in Buffalo, like I talk to local people in Buffalo and a lot of them are like, really? Like there's people coming to Buffalo? Like really? And like, yeah. And um, a lot of people assume that like in order to be either in the vacation rental business or in the midterm rental business, like you need to be in Miami or New York or LA or whatever, Dallas, Atlanta. Um, and I would actually advocate for the opposite. I would encourage most people, like it sounds weird, and this I'm not saying this is the apple's absolute truth, but this is like my little take on it, is that if you hear a place is good for short-term rentals, I would actually stay out of that city. I'd stay out of there <laughs> because guess what? Every That's where everyone wants to go, and um, the competition becomes so fierce. Look at like if you go, let's say, on Airbnb or whatever. If you look at short-term or mid-term rentals in, let's say, Miami, um, it's very competitive. And it's all profession. It's all people like of my skill set who have been, or or better who have been in the business for five years, ten years. They're taking professional photos. They're optimizing for search engine, you know, SEO. They're like doing all the things, and you're slugging it out with the big boys. Um, go to a place like Buffalo, New York, or like Rochester, New York, or any city that maybe has a population of less than 250,000 people. Um, and look at the competition there. It's much easier. I'm crushing the like with all like to be like whatever all due respect i'm crushing the competition here because like <laughs> most people in the city uh you know are it's more like mom and pa operators who are taking cell phone photos um who are like you know they don't even know what search engine optimization is um they're not like really optimizing their listings or you know most of them are working day jobs of course like i'm full-time now um so this is all to say I would way rather take a small to mid-sized city and just like take over the city. Um, so that's kind of been my goal is like I am I want to be and am quickly becoming the go-to corporate housing provider for the city of Buffalo. Awesome. And there's needs everywhere, right? Like there's needs in the tiny rural towns because it's not like, yes, it's traveling medical professionals. It's also people who are relocating and they don't have a house yet and they want to get to know the area. It's also corporate travelers. It's also snowbirds in certain areas. Uh -huh. There's people who, you know, maybe they want to go live down the road from their grandkids for three months. There's so many different needs, especially now that working remote. I mean, look at all three of us. We're all at home. <laughs> We're all three of us are working from home right now. Yeah. So who's not like, me? My AC's out. <laughs> It's working from the in-laws. This is actually one of my <laughs> my uh, my uh, midterm rental units. It's not my home. Hey, <laughs> but like none of us, none of us are in an office, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Like it's a new world, and there's demand everywhere. And as you're talking about those small to mid-sized cities, Kelly knows this. My midterm rentals are all in Iowa. Well, who goes to? Like, why would you ever think I'm going to go to Iowa? And it's because these people aren't there to vacation right? They're there to serve a contract. They're there because they're relocating. I've had travel nurses. I've also had corporate tenants. I've had students who are like on an internship for a couple of months. Um, I've had people who are moving and they're like, we have never even been here, but we're getting relocated and we want to know what area of the city we want to live in before we blindly buy a house. Like if there's needs everywhere it's not just miami and and san diego and i'll speak to kelly's portfolio a little bit because she's in austin but correct me if i'm wrong kelly but a lot of your properties are not in downtown austin but they're kind of in the offshoots or uh, you Ooh, know downtown's expensive north. i don't have any in downtown <laughs> right because right. again there's needs everywhere right exactly we have people who who come up to us at conferences and they're like 
do you think a midterm rental would work here? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes. It's the easiest question I ever, I the ever answer. Always yes. Yeah. yeah. The answer is the answer is always yes, unless you're talking about like Antarctica or something. Like the answer is always yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and to add to that, like I get people always ask me too, like they're looking for market research. Where should I invest? I think there's also a lot of, um, and people are always hyper focused on like the quantitative um, aspects. So they're looking exactly like, is there demand? Is there, what's the supply of this and that? There's also a, like a qualitative, um, aspect to consider. So it's like, you know, should I invest in North Carolina? It's like, well, do you enjoy going to North Carolina? Like where, what do you know about North Carolina? where, yeah, exactly. Right. Like, you know, would I necessarily tell anyone you should absolutely invest in Buffalo, New York? No, but like, I'm from here. I know the area. Right. I, uh, you know, most of the time I enjoy it here. Um, so it's like, it's, Honestly, it's not like I did a ton of market research on the city of Buffalo. It was a qualitative thing. It was, it, or you know, it was just like, this is where I live. This is kind of what I know, and this is where I've been able to build up a network of people and build relationships. So yeah, I'm gonna go all in here. So I want to jump into something that you mentioned on our intro call, which was there are many bleeding landlords out there right now. Uh, go into that a little bit because we are in a different time in the real estate market. So as a midterm rental arbitrage host, how have you found that you can be the solution for those bleeding landlords? And who are those bleeding landlords out there? <laughs> There's bleeding landlords everywhere. There's landlords who are, or, you know, property owners who are quickly growing a portfolio and they might be struggling to get all their units filled, not necessarily because they're not nice units or not because they're not in a great area, but because um, their, their management company is just basically either just failing or dropping the ball or they're focused on expanding their portfolio. And next thing, you know, they have a 24 unit building, but seven of the units are vacant. So as an arbitrage operator, you can, if you can like identify these um, landlords and you can tell this op this this landlord who has a 24 unit building and seven units vacant which is really bad that's over 30 percent of your units are vacant um, yeah. if you can tell them hey I'll rent all seven apartments like today next month um, they'll like they they'll they'll like that they'll Thank like you. you yeah they'll appreciate <laughs> that um, and they they'll be willing to give you possibly be willing they should be willing to give you concessions, meaning, mm -hmm. you know, most of my, the deals that I'm doing now, the most recent deal I've done, um, it was, I'm doing a three year, I'm renting three apartments at one time. It's a three year lease on all apartments with the two, uh, two first months are rent free. So I'm not paying rent for the first two months. And then also nice. just a 50% security deposit. Okay. So when you're working That's with, great. you know, um, uh, the right landlords, like you ought to be, because as an arbitrage operator, you are bringing a ton of value as a tenant. I pay my rent on time every single time. My landlords don't even have to think about it. Um, I'm taking care of the units. They're um, constantly in great shape. Um, they're being cleaned in between each and each and every stay. They're being basically they're getting a free manager. You know, I'm basically mm -hmm. managing it for free, and uh, I'm also renting multiple apartments at one time and doing a multi-year lease. So with all those being said, yeah, I do expect some rent concessions up front to help me with my uh, furnishing costs, marketing costs, and vacancy, you know, that there's gonna be some vacancy up front. For sure. Have you, over the years, have you learned certain things to make sure and put in the contract with these uh, landlords to, to protect yourself from being, you know, maybe kicked out of a, of a property or what have you learned along the way for the contract side of it? Yeah. So I do have some lease addendums that are in all of my, uh, contracts. So one, um, I have ways to, uh, responsibly break leases if needed. So if a property is for whatever reason, isn't making money or is, is losing money. Um, one thing I can do, and I have this in the, the lease addendum is that I can basically find the landlord, a new traditional tenant to, to ah. sign a fresh lease. And I can basically back out of the deal and I just bring them a new qualified traditional tenant. Smart. Um, I'm also, I have it in the contract that I am allowed to, um, sell my, um, contract and furnishers, basically be able to sell my business. Um, to a future operator 
who okay. um and now most of the landlords agree with that but they say they want uh they want like a say in the operator which is fine with me because if i'm selling to another operator i'd want to make sure it's a a good an experienced operator or whatever um but that allows me like i'm building a business right and it's arbitrage and most people when they're doing arbitrage they don't consider the fact that you can sell that business at some point so um not saying that i am planning on selling but i want to make sure that i have that option that if something ever say something happens to me and i can't manage my units anymore i want to be able to sell my portfolio to somebody else who can just like basically take over things and and whatever run the business their way um i'm glad we got into this on the on the conversation because we don't talk about that on the arbitrage side a lot have you had to go ahead and find a long-term tenant for any of your places not, or not yet i have not i have not yet um good and ev every single lease that i've ever had except for my very first one every single one has re-signed so if i did a two-year lease they've always re-signed or in the beginning i was i as I was learning, I was doing like, I did some one year leases have always resigned. So yeah. That's great. Yeah. All right. So talk to us about furnishings. Cause this is a lot of couches you're buying. <laughs> I want to know everything from, I know you said you reinvest the profits. So I'm assuming a good chunk of that goes towards furnishing the next units. Right. Um, but how do you kind of manage inventory? How do you know what to order? How do you deal with setting it all up? Um, all those kind of logistical things when it comes to furnishings. It's a lot of work to get units set up. Um, so I buy, I have a checklist that I use basically. I buy, I have a whole list of everything that I just buy straight off of um, Amazon and then maybe also like Target. And I have a couple like, and these are like the basic kitchen wares, the basic, all the bathroom necessities. I just order straight off Amazon or I have a couple other websites. I just order everything on the checklist and have it sent right to the property and then just set everything up there. Um, and then as far as like the bigger stuff, like the couches, mattresses, bed frames, um, I buy a ton of stuff from uh, well, in in my in Buffalo, there's like a local um, uh, supplier that sells Amazon um, overstock and return nice. items. So I'm buying like tons of, of stuff from them where it's just, again, it's Amazon overstock and returns and they're selling it at like a 30 to 50% discount. So I, that's where I buy a ton of my um, couches. All my mattresses come from there. So I'm getting, you know, 100 to $200 off all my mattresses. Um, and then I also, you also just gotta like keep, I'm constantly on the hunt and look for new furniture and new items. So, um, for example, recently there's like a hotel liquidation sale that I attended and I bought like, I bought a hundred pillows. I bought, um, 30 floor lamps. I bought a bunch of desk lamps, a bunch of miscellaneous stuff just because it was on sale and it's good stuff from a hotel. Um, so just constantly on the search and on the hunt, I'm always kind of like browsing Facebook marketplace, looking for good furniture that's for sale that I could just pick up. Um, so that's it. It's just, like nice. this is so funny. One time I got an email about like, or I stumbled upon something where there was a really good sale on spe these specific couches on Wayfair that were like being discontinued. And they were like really good leather couches that used to be like $1,200 and they were on sale for like 300 bucks. Well, all my properties are, well, all of our arbitrage properties are by my family in Iowa. And my mom calls me one day and she goes, um, so a couch just arrived at my door. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to tell you. <laughs> wow. I you bought forgot? that. <laughs> and I was like, I, yeah, but like she has a two car garage and one car. So I was like, you have plenty <laughs> of space. And this was, we didn't even have the next property on our radar. Yeah. And I was like, we'll use it at some point. She's like, so you want me to just put this giant box in my garage until we get around to using it. And I was like, yeah, exactly. So that'd be great. If you don't mind doing that, please and thank you. A couch is in a box? You. Oh yeah, it comes from Wayfair. How does that work? I know, I'm, we are, because we're local, we just pick everything up with our good old Texas sized truck. <laughs> no, but it was a great deal and it's a great couch and now it's in a unit and it looks amazing. But my poor mom had to just deal with it in her garage for a solid two or three months. And I was like, Sorry, not sorry. It was a good deal. Yep. How does the couch fit in a box? It's I really a, it's a big ass box. They take the legs off the bottom of the couch okay. and they just ship it in a, a big box. And a lot of times the back comes off and they put it flat. 
Wow. So they just save saving space and then you just it's probably it sounds pretty quick to put together when you need to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes 15 minutes, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Cool. The one thing when I was looking through your listings on Furnish Finder Christian that really impressed me about your furnishings was how many smart TVs of good size you had throughout each of your units. It wasn't just one in the living room. You pretty much anywhere there was a common space or a bedroom, you have large quality uh, smart TVs. So have you found that to like what kind of feedback do you get from your guests that stay about those extra expenses and have you found it beneficial? Yeah, I for me, yes. Now I do have one property that I think you're you're talking about specifically. It's my three bedroom. I have to admit, oh. so that that specific property, um, I did not furnish myself. It was actually a, the landlord who furnished that property, and they didn't like they went balls to the wall. They spent a lot of money furnishing the place to list it on Airbnb, and then they did Airbnb for like a couple months and decided they didn't want to do it anymore. And that was when they called me to start renting their apartments. So I rent three units from this landlord, and um, they were already furnished. So I'm I, in this specific deal, I'm renting. The apartment and all the furniture. So in that in that specific deal, I didn't even buy all those TVs. It was like already okay, okay. installed. Um, but yeah, people love it. People love the, the TVs. I think it's like. So what's your normal style throughout? You know, with the with the other 27, do you typically have one TV in the home? What's your what's your normal go to for your different sizes? Yeah, it depends on the layout. A lot of them are just because uh, they're just studio apartments. It's like there's just one TV in the apartment. Um, but then some of my like two bedrooms I do have, um, in the living room. And then I have, uh, like the one I'm thinking about, I have one in the living room and then I have a TV in the master bedroom, but I don't have a TV in the other bedroom. So it depends. Okay. It, it all depends on the layout of the place and, and your budget at the time. But TVs are so cheap now too. And they're always on sale. Yeah, I know. For 200 bucks, you know. And are you providing cable or streaming? What's your what's your style of? Just streaming. I provide like a Hulu Plus, Disney Plus, and ESPN Plus. Is that is that included on the TV or you have like a package that you just set up on all of your? It's, um yeah, so I have like all Roku smart TVs. And then so I just okay. log them into those accounts. Like when I set up the apartment, I log into those accounts and then just keep it there. And then if guests need the um, email and password like for the to log into it, I give it to them because I set up like an email, like the name of my email is uh, like it's like Hulu at Buffalo Corp Housing. So it's like an email. I set up an email specifically for my Hulu accounts, if that makes okay. sense. So I'm comfortable just giving them the email and the, the password because it's just like a throwaway email. You might be one of the few people we've talked to that actually provide, like, we've talked to a fair number of people that say, here, you know, it's all ready for streaming, log into your own accounts. But I think you're one of the, the one of the rare few that actually provide the service. So that's, that's kind of a cool marketing thing that you're giving them, right? Yeah, it's $12 a month. It's, it's, you know, and it's a nice little touch, you know. And, it... and you can share that one account through all your properties yeah you're gonna love this katie i'm pulling out some landlord diaries facts the other person that also had like a really good system like this with her login uh was cheryl with the tiny houses so if you're intrigued by tiny houses go back and listen to cheryl's episode but Kelly's uh, an encyclopedia <laughs> i'm the landlord diaries encyclopedia <laughs> so if someone purchases a movie what do you do um, I have it blocked, so they can't they yeah, can't okay. they can't do that they, if they want to. Nice. And I don't have a credit card linked up either to the like account, so they yeah they can't okay. do that. That was a really fun conversation about furnishings. I hope you all got some great ideas from Christian about how to scale for your arbitrage spaces or your properties that you own as well. We all do it differently, and that's what I love on our show is like. We're all going for the same goals, but we do it and get to it in a different way and can all be an encouragement to each other. So I'm constantly trying to not take the chameleon approach of, ooh, I like what Christian's doing. I'm doing that. Ooh, I like what Katie's doing. I'm doing that. <laughs> you got to stay focused on your big picture. 
Yeah, there's not one right way, right? There's a million right ways. Yeah, there's a ton of great ways to do it. So thanks for sharing everything you've shared so far, Christian. We're going to jump into our section that we call Furnish Finder and Key Check Favorites. And I believe you use the Key Check for your midterm rental uh, tools, some of them. So tell us, uh, you know, which parts of Key Check you use and what advice you have for others. Yeah, I use uh, Key Check all the time. I love it. I do. Uh, I use it for my screening checks. Um, so when I have just for, uh, to give some more value to people, when I have, mm -hmm. uh, travel nurses that come to book with me, I allow them to book simply, um, their screening check is basically just to send me a copy of their contract. So if they send me, if they have a travel nurse contract and they send me that, a copy of that, I can bypass the screening check because they are being, I know that they are being screened by the hospitals. Um, However, anyone who's not a recruit, uh, uh, a travel nurse, I use keycheck.com to um, do a screening check. I think it costs like $40 for them to uh, do yep. it. Exactly. And then after that, I uh, write up lease agreements for them using keycheck.com. It's super easy. It stays specific. So, And then uh, once they send the lease agreement, they submit payment. Nice. <laughs> I think the payments are my favorite part about uh, yeah. Keys Check. Like all the tools are amazing, but if I had to pick a favorite, it's it's the payments. Nice. Good. Why? Yeah. Because it sends like the automatic reminders and then I get the happy emails. It's like your tenant <laughs> submitted a payment and I'm like, ooh, I didn't have to do anything. Mm. Like anything that makes it so it's a system. So I don't I don't have to do unnecessary steps, right? Because no one's time is best spent saying, oh, I wonder if they paid the rent, I should check. Or, oh, I need to remind them to pay the rent. Like, mm -hmm. all of those things are things that in today's day and Asian world, like, just need to be automated. So yeah. that I just, I just really appreciate anything like that, that can take those kind of meaningless tasks and just systematize it. Yep. And the payments on KeyCheck is really good at thinking through every scenario that a landlord might, ch how a landlord might choose to use the rent payment pro program, right? Because some want to get paid on the same day of move-in each month. Some want it always on the 1st, some want it on the 15th. So it's like, there are ways to make that happen uh, no matter when you want to get paid. Right. So I also really appreciate how it allows a tenant to pay with a credit card if they'd like, so they can get their points and their miles and we yeah, all want sure. our points and our miles, but I don't want that fee taken out of my, like I pay enough fees. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of one of those things where as a user, I would expect, okay, if I want to put my rent on my credit card, I know I'm going to have to cover the service charge. Right. Um, and that's up to the, the traveler or the tenant to decide if they want to do that or not. But, um, I like that that doesn't hurt our bottom lines. Dave's an, Dave's an expert at the tr uh, credit card travel points. We, when we flew to, he grew up in Greece. And so when we, that's, and Dave's my husband, for those that don't know that. Uh, when we fly to Greece and back, we typically can do it for around a hundred bucks each because all we do is pay the taxes. We don't, yep. you know, we use points for everything else. So he's same, really same. good at mm -hmm. that. <laughs> same here. All my travel is all credit card points. Yeah. That's the great, that's the other perk of being a business owner is you're spending mm -hmm. all this money and you're built, you're earning all these points. And then of course, typically before furnishing apartments, I am signing up for like a new business credit card that offers mm -hmm. like a, yes. a hefty sign on bonus. Cause yes. it's like, I know I'm going to spend you know, X amount of dollars. So I'll sign up for like a chase credit card that'll give you like spend 6,000 and you make 750. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a 10% more than a 10% return right off the bat. Yep. So, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm signing up for new before I, if I know that I'm going to be furnishing a bunch of units, I'll sign up for a new business credit card. Smart planning for sure. Yeah. Uh, one thing that Katie and I use for business uh, on Furnish Finder, you also use for your business is Monday.com. So tell us how you've incorporated Monday.com into your systems. And I actually like how you said it's the first thing you do each each morning. Yeah. No. Yeah. I. I have, so Monday is just like a. What? How would you define Monday? It's, it's like, like a task management software. Task. Right? Okay. Yeah. So I use it to basically to keep track of all my uh, bookings, all my check-ins, checkouts, um, like how much rent they're paying, what their deposit is, when their rents are due. I just use it as yeah to manage all my 
booking. So I know like my uh, current guests, my upcoming guests, and I have my past guests, and I use it to store all their phone numbers and email addresses and contact information, all that stuff. So. And I think, again, there it's find a system that works for you. Kelly and I talked to someone yesterday who uses a spreadsheet. We've talked to use, we've talked to people who use Yardi, which is a very sophisticated software for real estate. It, it use what works for you. Um, I know, especially with you know CRM softwares or task management softwares, a lot of times there'll be one that kind of clicks with the way your brain works more than another one. Mm-hmm. So my personal biggest suggestion there to anyone listening would be take some time and just play around with them. Like it might not feel like a good use of your time, but it really is. Uh, Throughout my career, I've used a handful of different ones and there's definitely some where like my husband loves a certain one and I get in there and I'm like, this is like Chinese to me. Like it does not make sense to my brain. So find whatever way works for you and then use it. Right. That's the whole point of these softwares. So when you when you get a furnished finder lead or you get a furnished finder booking, how do you keep everything straight? Oh, I just as soon as I get someone that uh, basically signs the lease agreement, um, I just input into Monday dot com all that tenants information, their their full name, which property they're staying at. Uh, check-in date, check-out date, you know, so I just input all their information into it. And then you can like filter, basically I'll check, go log into my Monday every morning and I'll just filter like for uh, upcoming uh, checkouts. Mm, so yes. I'll just see like who's checking out. Okay. Like, okay, we have a checkout tomorrow and the day after and just like, um, so I'll manage that way. And then I'll go to my upcoming guest section And I'll filter for check-ins and see, like, okay, who's checking in when, and uh, just do it that way. So as I get bookings, that's when I input them into monday.com, and then I can just filter for all my checkouts, my check-ins, and uh, when they're, you know, I accept all my rent payments are either due on the 1st or on the 15th of every month. So, like, depending on when they check in, they're either paying on the 1st or on the 15th. So, um you know, that's obviously in my Monday software. It's like, when is the rent due and all that. Love it. That's great. All right. So I have a question that I'm guessing a lot of listeners are also wondering because you have so many properties, right? And a lot of turnovers and, and just a lot of kind of things juggling around or what else do you use to kind of manage the chaos, right? As far as like bookkeeping goes or messaging, uh, messaging or accounting. We know you use Monday and you use key check. What other kind of, what other tools are in your, are in your toolbox? Yeah. So I use QuickBooks um, and I have like, I hired their like bookkeeping service. So it's like $200 a month and they, take care of all my books which was like heaven sent because I in the beginning was doing it myself and I'm like that is not my strong suit so I use QuickBooks their bookkeeping service um, I use uh, something called open phone uh, which gives me it gives you it's just like a, a separate business number um, so that any uh, direct communications with guests I'm using my business uh, number. I'm not using obviously using my personal cell phone number to communicate with guests. And open phone is cool too because um, I can pull it up on my laptop and I'm like texting with people from my laptop. And then also um, I'm in the middle of hiring a virtual assistant right now. Um, I've interviewed a couple assistants, so in the next oh in the next couple of weeks I should have a virtual assistant who I should who will uh, be able to like use open phone to communicate with my guest and I'll still be able to um, uh, view all the messages and everything that's going on between the virtual assistant and the guests and it's also cool too because it does uh, you can call people through open phone and it'll show up in the same like it'll show up in the text thread that there was a call done so you don't have to like go to like uh, you don't have to switch between like phone conversations and text conversations. It all shows up in the same thread, if that makes sense. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Any more tools or is that is that good? That's basically it, man. Okay, nice. And the messaging, how do you do messaging? I have message templates basically that I copy and paste. And then people that I do like get like about 50% of my bookings over Airbnb. And the ones that are over Airbnb, I have those ones automated. Uh-huh. I like when people book with me directly, like over Furnish Finder, I think much more because Airbnb is just 
damn expensive. Um, but uh, I have uh, automated, you know, when people do book over Airbnb, the automated messages get sent out. And then do you uh, track that in Monday too? It's like when they need to receive the, do you have a filter on Monday that says, okay, send them the checkout procedure or send them this? Yep. Yep. All right. So we all have seen uh, on short-term platforms such as Airbnb, there might be uh, events offered and Christian is one that offers one of those really fun events. He offers goat yoga. Tell us about your goat yoga. (laughs) I've seen it in Austin. I've always wanted to participate and I haven't yet. Yeah, so for those who don't know, like goat yoga is exactly what it sounds like. Like it's literally yoga with basic with little baby goats running around. Um, <laughs> it's a silly little thing that we so do because um, my my family does. Yeah, it is. It's cute. Um, it's a cute little fun event that people love. Um, and we do private events for goat yoga. So um, my family. Do you my, have like a a goat yoga family? So. <laughs> He I wants have, to say yes. He no, almost just I, said yes. I said, I, like, yes, I do I, have a goat. I, yoga I have family. a family. <laughs> I have a family who owns a farm. My dad and my brother okay. started a farm together like seven years ago. They've got um, over a hundred sheep. They've got about a twenty goats. Um, they have over a hundred chickens, and they do some crops and things like that. Um, and um, well, we heard about like people were doing goat yoga, and we figured like we can offer that. So. Um, Basically, people will hire us for like private events. Um, we've done like, and we haven't done that many events. We've we've been doing it like uh, four years now, and each year we do like two or three events. Um, but it's like uh, kids' birthday parties, or we've done like a. Um, recently, we did one for a public school for like their staff. Um, so it was just like a fun event that the school could do for their staff. That's fun. Um, and you know they'll just pay us. We, we come to them. And we'll set up a temporary fence. We hire a yoga instructor. I'm obviously not a licensed yoga instructor. We hire one. And then um, she does an awesome job doing base- a very basic uh, yoga class with little – and yeah. we bring our, uh, you with know, five, Now, six- can you teach the goats to do jujitsu? jitsu so <laughs> Goat jujitsu. I, there's, you know what? I have a tough enough time teaching people how to do jujitsu. So oh, I'm just saying, I think there's an opportunity here worth exploring. I don't know. Little baby goats, <laughs> pew pew. Come on. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, do any of your so. nurses take you up on the offer? Do have any of your guests also gone to goat yoga? Not no, because we do. So we're doing private events. So you, you okay. no, yeah, you have to have a group. Like it's it's typically yeah. Like we're not doing like selling a. Uh, it's not like you open to the public. Ticket. Yeah, no, it's someone calls us and says, hey, we're we have like a a birthday party. There's gonna be twelve kids. Can you come and do like do your goat yoga got it, event? Got it. So it's like a private event thing. It's it's so not cool. like open to the public, <laughs> but yeah, you know. I love it. love it. Well, this has been a fun episode. Thanks for everything you've shared, Christian. I'm sure it's going to encourage many landlords out there. And remember, if you'd like to connect with Christian, then you can find his Furnish Finder profile on the show notes on YouTube or on audio platforms. And just like you would for any other traveler, just hit that contact information and reach out to Christian on open phone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christian, for being here. <laughs> um, I hope you all have a great day and don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. See you later.